Thank you, Craig. Well, good evening. We're going to jump right into it and see. Um, can you advance the whoop? There we go. I see. What we've got is a little delay here. Okay. So uh, here are my disclosures. And Craig, uh, I'm advancing, and it's not advancing. So why don't I let you advance? I'll just say next, okay? Okay. So you take back control, because there we go. This just shows the incident rates in Americans who are 40 and over for the major age-related ocular diseases. We're going to be very busy in the years to come. You see advanced AMD, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, dry eye. The actual numbers from 2004, and then the prevalence estimated for the year 2020. You see that all of them are going up very dramatically. Dry eye is expected to go up 38%. So we will be quite busy in the years to come. Next. And this shows the progression of dry eye disease. We know it is a progressive, potentially irreversible disease, and left untreated, the cycle of inflammation is really a, a downward spiral, and dysfunction can cause permanent damage to the lacrimal gland. Here you see, if you treat somebody with vehicle, basically artificial tears, you can see in this study that there was almost a 40% increase in T cells, markers for inflammation, even after six months of treatment with the best vehicle, the Endura vehicle that is uh, the vehicle for restasis. So without um, active intervention, the, this can actually lead to loss of vision and blindness. Next. So the late stage chronic changes we see here, telangiectasia, dislocation of meibomian glands and gland atrophy, and scarring. Next. And our goal is to intervene before people get to this level. So we see patients like this all the time, and in the past we haven't always focused on these people. We're always scanning for our surgical cases, but we certainly see patients with the conditions that you see listed on the top all the time. We see people with osteoporosis, diabetes, Sjogren's, lupus, all the things you see there, asthma, scleroderma, of course, contact lens wearers, refractive surgery patients. And our patients take the medicines listed below, all of which exacerbate dry eye, the diuretics, the antidepressants, the oral contraceptives, the blood pressure meds, et cetera. Next. So we have a lot of challenges in our dry eye classification systems. First, the patients often present with very conflicting signs. For instance, they might have a very low Schirmers, less than five millimeters, but a very high tear breakup time, more than seven seconds. They might have evidence of central corneal staining, but normal tremors and a normal tear breakup time. Also, the symptoms alone are insufficient to determine severity. Questionnaires provide very poor specificity. Unfortunately, the current standard of care relies on symptoms because we haven't had good metrics up until now. That would be like uh, trying to manage a diabetic by saying, hey, are you thirsty today? Oh, you are? Let's give you a, a, you know, a few more units of insulin. Patients are very unsatisfied with their current standard of care, and they tend to migrate from practice to practice, seeking somebody who will listen to them and better options. Also, the existing signs show poor correlation to, tears, to uh, disease severity. Schirmer strips, tear breakup time, and staining are essentially a coin flip, as you will see. Next. So let's start with tear osmolarity testing with the tear lab tear collection system. Next. So osmolarity in the diagnosis of dry eye disease is critical. It is actually considered the gold standard test for dry eye. There's 45 years of peer-reviewed research to support this. Osmolarity has been actually added to the definition of dry eye. And because uh, a high osmolarity is an indication of a concentrated tear film, it's considered the global marker for dry eye. If you look at the positive predictive value of all the classic dry eye tests, you see that the highest by far is osmolarity, followed by Schirmer's at 31%, way below the 87% for osmolarity, and the rest fall below that. Next. So 
cure osmolarity is actually listed in the American Academy of Ophthalmology Preferred Practice Pattern. And um, actually, for the first time ever, the Academy actually listed a, uh, a company, the Tier Lab Osmolarity System, a lab on a chip test. Uh, and it says that Tier Osmolarity has been shown to be a more sensitive method of diagnosing and grading the severity of dry eye compared to all the other tests. Next. So the classic dues report, the dry eye workshop report that was released in 2007, says that your hyperosmolarity is the central mechanism that causes ocular surface inflammation, cell damage, and symptoms in dry eye disease. Next. And it stimulates this cascade of inflammatory events. First, hyperosmolarity increases inflammatory tear cytokines and MMPs, matrix metalloproteinase, this markers for inflammation, apoptotic cell death, which is basically uh, suicide, cell suicide, where it kills itself, reduced and altered tear mucins, reduced lubrication, and upregulation of HLA-DR expression on the surface cells, disruption of epithelial junctions, and intracytoplasmic changes in the surface cells. Next. So this is sort of a snapshot view of the most important things to know about tear osmolarity. Normal subjects have a low and stable osmolarity. It's very similar to the osmolarity of blood at 290 milliosmoles per liter. It indicates that the tears are held in proper homeostasis. However, dry eye subjects have elevated and unstable osmolarity. So the osmolarity changes like crazy between eyes and over time. And variability is the hallmark of dry eye disease. If the difference between uh, one eye and the next is greater than 8 milliosmoles per liter, even if the two values are down in the normal range, the fact that they vary by more than eight is critical, and it's a definition, part of the definition of uh, hyperosmolarity in dry eye. And stated differently, osmolarity was found to be the least variable of all the common signs. And you see the ballistic tear osmolarity is by far less variable than all the others, including corneal staining. Next. This is from a classic paper showing the variability of dry eye disease. The normal subjects are in the bottom row. The dry eye subjects are in the top row. There are three of each. If you look at the bottom row first, you see that these normal subjects were seen three times a day on three separate days, and their osmolarity bounces very little. Even though they're tired in the evening and they've been on a computer all day, really the values for right and left eye are very stable. Now look at the top row. Over the course of a day, the values are swinging all over the place. And over the course of the three days, they swing all over. Look at dry eye subject number three, or even number two. Very, very huge swings between the right and left eye and even uh, from moment to moment amongst the same eye. Next. So people say, well, it varies, so it must be a crummy test. No, it is a crummy disease. The variability is terrible for moment to moment in dry eyes. But the tear osmolary precision is excellent. First, we're only sampling 90, uh, sorry, 50 nanoliters, 50 nanoliters of liquid. And there's a 1.5% coefficient of variation, which is outstanding. We consider blood glucose to be a very highly uh, precise test, and yet it's sampling five microliters, and the uh, precision is greater than or equal to 5% coefficient of variation. Cholesterol samples 20 microliters and has greater than 4% coefficient of variation. So here you can see 20 microliters, 5, and 50 nanoliters, and you see that it's extraordinary how precise it is considering the tiny volume being tested. So in 2009, it actually won a test for extreme precision through a group uh, that specializes in in vitro diagnostics. Next. This shows a, a very classic study from Ben Sullivan that was published last year. And it shows a bunch of dry eye patients with elevated osmolarity. Here you see um, the more severe measurement of the two eyes is in the white circle and the average between the right eye, left eye is in red. So months one, two, and three, they're slowly getting worse. At month three, you see the vertical line on the graph they got uh, restasis, they got cyclosporine treatment. Immediately, both values, the more severe measurement and the average between the two eyes, starts to improve. 
going down, 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 and the standard error bars get smaller. By month six, the average between the two eyes and the more severe measurement are basically on top of each other. That improvement in osmolarity predicted the improvement in symptoms, which lagged behind the improvement in osmolarity. And corneal staining, tear breakup time, and tumors are all over the place. Some of them actually get worse. They are not predictive of a response to uh, cyclosporin. Next, only osmolarity was. And it predicted the, uh, the uh, increased happiness of the patients on the questionnaire as well. So a very interesting study was done, dry eye in a general patient population. 119 sites participated in the study across Europe and the U.S. Almost 8,400 subjects ranging in age from 7 to 98 years with an average of 56 years. And they asked them all sorts of questions, demographic, and about their symptoms. Next. So it turns out almost half had dry eye as defined by uh, hyper, hyper, using osmolarity as the standard. In other words, they had greater than or equal to 308 milliosmoles per liter. Almost half. These were just everybody walking through the door for whatever reason. 80% reported at least one symptom of dry eye disease. Of those people reporting symptoms, basically half had dry eye and half had some other form of ocular irritation. 20% of the hyperosmolar patients, or, or I should say 20% of all the people coming in were asymptomatic, but of those people with no complaints, 43% had mild to moderate dry eye disease as defined by their osmolarity, and 57% were within the normal homeostatic range. So once again, symptoms alone are a poor arbiter of disease. Next. So, big snapshot here on tear osmolarity. The normal range is 296. This is from the Lent paper. 296 plus or minus 8 milliosmoles. Dry eye subjects, though, have an average score of 323 plus or minus 16 milliosmoles. The normal subject inter-eye difference is 7 or less, 7 plus or minus 6. The dry eye subject inter-eye difference is 17 plus or minus 15. So once again, the intra and inter-eye difference that is the hallmark of dry eye disease, is greater than 8 milliosmoles per liter between eyes. Next. Now, um, we're going to talk more about finances toward the end, but tear osmolarity does have a CPT code. You see it here. It's under the laboratory fee schedule. It's billed under their medical plan. This is the ICD-9 code that exists for dry eye that we use the most, 375.15. It's 100% reimbursed by CMS on the laboratory fee schedule. The national CMS reimbursement is 22.71 per eye. There is no patient copay and no deductible with Medicare. And it does require a CLIA waiver, which they help you with. Next. So um, here you see that you have to use 83861 microfluidic analysis twice, once for each eye. And you have to remember to charge for the office visit also, which is usually a level three or an intermediate ophthalmic visit. And you can also bill for it on follow-up appointments to determine if your therapy is appropriate or effective. So if you're going to start them on tears or restasis or ointment at night or omega-3s or whatever, when you bring them back, you know, six to eight weeks later, whatever, you can check it again. It will not be contested. It is a reasonable thing to do. And it, it helps you very much to track uh, response to treatment and compliance. Next. So it's performed in just a few seconds. It really improves clinical workflow. Uh, patient retention uh, creates recurring revenue. So as you'll see, the average dry eye patient in my practice, for the first year anyway, comes back four times. So we'll go over that in a minute. So if you test every time they come, which is a reasonable thing to do, that is recurring revenue. It delays patients from dropping out of contact lenses. And um, because it guides treatment, you can keep your patients in contacts. Uh, Pre-op treating dry eye definitely improves your post-op uh, outcomes for LASIK or cataract surgery. And patients love the metric. It improves their patient satisfaction. They often say, gosh, my other doctor doesn't have this. Um, they, they're proud if their score improves with treatment, and it, it helps you get referrals from other patients. Next. So I would say if you're going to get into this, definitely look into tear osmolarity. Now, the tear science thermal pulsation system. 
when we became a dry eye center of excellence, this was the next thing that we added uh, almost simultaneous with the Oculus Keratograph. But let me tell you a little about the thermal pulsation system next. This is a 12-minute procedure that received FDA clearance in 2011. These are little uh, eye cups that fit beneath the lids. They rest on the sclera. They do not touch the cornea. They heat and massage the meibomian glands without increasing any pressure on the cornea or the globe. So it clears obstructed meibom far better than hot compresses. Hot compresses apply heat to the lids and very little of it actually gets it back to the tarsal plate because the heat is wicked away by the blood vessels in the lid. Whereas you'll see the heat is applied almost directly to the meibomian gland with this system. It is not covered by insurance. Nationwide the professional fees are averaging about fifteen hundred per patient for both eyes. In uh, the Northeast Corridor where the rent is very high, especially in New York, we charge sixteen fifty. So it's $700 per patient for each disposable pair of eyepieces. They're used once and thrown away. Next. So, um, okay, next. There we go. Now, they, this flew through FDA approval. There are more studies that are out there uh, proving that it works. Next. But the FDA uh, data is available on their website. I'll show you one or two slides just to show you that it, it, it sailed through. Very safe, very effective. So here, now most patients are wearing two of these during the 12 minutes, but just to sort of show you. This sits lightly on their lids, and it's connected to the computer console that sits right on top of the, uh, the desk that's in every room, every exam lane. So the patients are tilted back at 45 degrees, in your exam lane, and they are not sedated or dilated, they don't need a driver, and um, both the upper and lower eyelids are treated simultaneously, and um, it's 12 minutes and it's very comfortable, it feels like a spa treatment. Next. So let's see if we can get this animation to run uh, and the sound as well, Craig. No, it doesn't look like the media is going to play. Okay, this shows um, that the heat is applied. You cannot see my cursor, can you? I yes. guess they can. You can see mine? Yep. Okay. Okay. Here you see that the heating element vaults over the cornea. It does not touch the cornea. It rests on the sclera. And the heat is applied right here next to the meibomian glands. So in the first two minutes of the 12-minute treatment, the lids are heated to a very comfortable degree. We've done this on over 1,000 people, and nobody has said, take this off, it's too hot. Once all the altered meibom is liquefied two minutes in, gentle pulsations start from these air bladders, and all the nasty goo, as I describe it to the patients, comes out. So that's why we take these high-tech eye cups and we throw them away after one use. You're very tempted to re-sterilize them, but you can't. And, and you know, they're loaded with the altered mybum that has been expressed from the patient's glands. Next. So, you know, I had, I had this myself. I was treated at 7.45 in the morning, and by 8 o'clock I was seeing my own patients. This is one of the many, 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 many slides from the FDA clinical trial that led to the approval in 2011. And this just shows the total meibomian gland score at baseline for these patients was very low. This is the number of clear, healthy glands secreting normal oil. So baseline and two weeks later, almost no change using just daily warm compresses. When these patients, though, who had basically failed treatment at two weeks of warm compresses were switched over uh, to Lipiflow, within two weeks their score was dramatically and statistically significantly improved. Next. Now, um, we have to stop for a second and say, wh why do we really care about all this? Untreated dry eye uh, for cataract surgery causes their pre-op K readings to be inaccurate. It results in the wrong choice of IOL power. We participated in Bill Trattler's uh, FACO study, and it showed that untreated dry eye can lead you to be a diopter or more off in your IOL selection. 
for LASIK, it results in lower diopteric accuracy as well, with lower uncorrected acuity and a much higher enhancement rate. That's been documented by several authors. And untreated dry eye leads to the presence of pro-inflammatory cytokines on the presence on the uh, ocular surface. And you know, I would love to see a study looking at whether or not, and this is just a theory of mine, whether or not untreated dry eye with all those pro-inflammatory cytokines swimming on the surface might not increase the chance of getting post-op CME. Just a theory of mine. There's no data to support it, but pro-inflammatory cytokines on the surface of a post-LASIK eye or post-cataract eye cannot be good. Next. Oh, nope, the other way. Nope, other way. There we go. Next. Okay, so uh, we have used that, uh, everything so far, with great success. The osmolarity, the pulsation, the thermal pulsation system from Cure Science. We are also really happy to have added the Keratograph 5M from Oculus at about the same time we got the Cure Science. So we were really getting into being and comfortable with being a dry eye center of excellence. It absolutely helps in the evaluation of the pre-op ocular surface. As you'll see, it, this one device does many things for your practice. It, inc it includes uh, a fantastic corneal topographer, contact lens fitting software, and as you'll see, several new things that specifically are aimed at uh, evaluating the pre-op ocular surface. Next. Those are the new things, which I'll go into in a second. Next. Well, first, the topographer is excellent. It gives you all the information uh, any other uh, Placido disk-based topographer would give you. Next. But there are a lot of new things. Next. And um, next. The cameras and the magnification systems have been very much improved. Next. Let me give you an example. Just keep clicking, Craig, and show the new one. Keep click, 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 click. Okay. Depending on the task that you're asking the Keratograph 5M to do, there are all these different illumination systems. There's white placido ring uh, for looking at the redness scan and the tear foam scan. There are infrared LED spots for the MIBO scan. The third image along blue LED spots for um, imaging during contact lens uh, checks when, if you want to check how a, a hard lens is fitting, a gas perm. And there are white LED spots for the tear film scan. Next. Next. Okay, so great. This shows the three magnifications that are possible. You want an 11 millimeter field of view for topography and the tear film scan. Sometimes you want a 9 millimeter field of view for a tear film, and you want a 26 millimeter field of view when you're looking at, at the MIBO scan and you're using the redness scan. Next. Oh, and imaging, of course. Imaging can be done with all three. Next. So documentation. Now, tear film assessment with the Keratograph 5M. Next. First, the tear meniscus height measurement. With the new magnification changer, an image of the curvature along the lid margin can be captured. And this is important because the curvature of the tear meniscus is not always constant. There are all sorts of particles and things in the tear film that make the meniscus irregular, like mucus, as you see here. So next, you can, next, you can measure either uh, by hand or automatically, the height of the tear meniscus and the volume of it. There's optical and digital magnification available to you. Uh, you can use it, uh, this with different light sources, infrared and white diodes. Infrared stimulates less reflex cheering, so that has become quite popular. And you can have automatic, calibrated, and digital measuring of the tear film height if you wish. Next. And here you see a more regular uh, quarter millimeter high uh, tear meniscus. Next. So there's also non-invasive care to graph breakup time. This is incredibly useful. This uh, 
gives you objective and very repeatable outcomes. It's automatically classified. You don't have to think about it. It's non-invasive. It's extremely quick. You can document control of dry eye and uh, progression of disease or you know, non-compliance response to treatment. It's a great communication tool with patients. Next. So how does this work? It automatically detects areas where the Myers are breaking up. So you see the regular Myers up top, bottom left, the Myers are starting to be distorted, and then an actual break is shown bottom right. Next. So, and uh, this just shows the image of the tear film at where the breaks are actually occurring. Next. And next. These are just pop-ins. And this shows the area that's actually, keep going, Craig, the, the area circled in red that are breaking up that's automatically detected. Next. And this shows what it looks like during the actual capture on the cornea. Next. Next and next. Good. Great. Now, this shows a really healthy eye. As you see bottom right with the red circle, this is level zero. This is a person who has no dry eye. And the color-coded contour map shows the number of seconds before the cheer film has broken up. So this healthy young person has an entire cornea with a greater than 24 second tear breakup time. And so this is especially uh, amazing because this person was born in 1950, uh, must be a male. Next. Without postmenopausal issues. Next. Now this shows uh, a level two dry eye, as you can see from the classification in the red circle bottom right. This is quite a dry eye. Now you see red, and you can see that the tear breakup time is terrible, actually, and it goes between 0.52 seconds, half a second at its absolute worst, to an average of 4.23 seconds. And I got those numbers from the bottom right box. The first breakup occurs only a half second after the eye is open between blinks, and only 4.23 seconds is the average breakup time. So this is this is only level two. It gets much worse at three and four. But this is an eye you don't want to operate on. No LASIK, no cataract surgery until you've treated this eye. Next. Now this shows the dramatic difference treatment can make. Uh, though it's a heavily underutilized, lipospray, uh, in the United States, there's only one that's available. It's uh, from Ocusoft. It's Cheers Again Advanced Liposome Spray. There's another one called LipoNit available in Europe. But it's a liposomal spray adding basically tiny microscopic fat balls to the tear film. This shows a lady using it right before and 10 minutes after the use. What a dramatic improvement in tear film breakup time has occurred with just one application. And uh, actually, the blepharitis workshop recommended using this four times a day, uh, starting at level two. Uh, for uh, mybomain gland disease. Next. And we know that 86% 80, of dry eye patients have uh, evaporative dry eye due to mybomain gland disease. So our best advice is before surgery, LASIK or cataract, if the central 5 millimeters has an average breakup time that's normal, uh, especially the central 3 millimeters, you can relax. This assures the cataract surgeon that the K ratings are probably accurate, very likely to be accurate, and assures the LASIK surgeon that the pre-op refraction and the wavefront map are also likely to be accurate. Next. So lipid layer assessment with the Keratograph 5M. Lipid layers uh, are very much like a uh, maybe oil or kerosene that you might see in a uh, pool of water in uh, a parking garage. The thicker the layer of lipid, the more colors you see, the wider the spectrum, just like with the bubble as well. Next. So next. Yeah. And keep popping in on this one, Craig. This shows that light is diffracted through the thick lipid layer and all these beautiful colors emerge. Next. OK, and next. Great. Next. OK, next, Craig. Thanks. I'm truly sorry to do this to you. <laughs> I wish I had control of the clicker. And this just shows the thicker, the more colors will appear. Next. 
Now, the lipid layer assessment with a slit lamp has been performed for many decades. And if you click on it, this should animate. You can see to the left of the slit beam a little half millimeter spot at 3 or 9 o'clock. And here you see in this animation, you can see some color there. This looks like a pretty healthy tear lake. You see a lot of colors in that little spot there, but it's an awfully small spot. Next. And here, and click again, here's the Keeler Tear Scope. Not everybody has one of these, but you get to see a four millimeter diameter area. And this, once again, looks like a pretty healthy tear lake. There are lots of colors in the spectrum that's visible over the central cornea. Next. But keep clicking. This is a bunch of pop-ins, Craig. This shows that the Oculus Keratograph gives you a nine millimeter observable field. And you can see all the colors there, are far superior to slip lamp uh, examination or the Keeler cheer scope. Next. And it, yeah, now this is an animation showing a person with a nice thick lipid layer, a really healthy eye, and you can see all those colors swimming by in between blinks, and they move a lot. Next. Now compare that to this, a thin lipid layer. Not only can you see the low tear meniscus, but you see there are very few colors here. It's mostly kind of a gray tone. And this indicates a very thin lipid layer. Next. Now, tear foam particle movement can be tracked. Next. Go ahead and pop in this whole thing. So the uh, direction, velocity, uh, dir direction and velocity of tear foam particle movement is an indicator of how thick the tear foam is. And we can see particles at the slit lamp all the time. We never pay any attention to them. But now, this is done automatically for us. Once again, an indicator of viscosity. Next. So here, this is, we see this all day long, right? You see all these little particles flying by between blanks. Their direction and viscosity, uh, direction and velocity are an indication of viscosity. Next. So, this system automatically detects single tear foam particles and tracks their speed and direction. Next. Next, Craig. OK, there you go. So next slide. Next. There you go. So once again, individual it would be just impossible for us to track an individual one, you know, trying to look at it with, with our eyes or even with, with calipers. It's just impossible to do this. But this is uh, part of the Oculus 5M. And uh, this German language, I am told, <laughs> explains that, that the viscosity uh, can be measured in this fashion with uh, direction and velocity of movement. Next. Now, my biography, I love this. When you avert the eyelids, which is necessary because the tarsus inside the eye blocks the light, so we take our cotton tip swab and we have the patient look down and we avert the lid. Next. And we can see the meibomian glands. But the very large working distance of the Keratograph 5M allows us to see the upper lower lids at the same time. Next. And to analyze them in the most spectacular fashion. So we need the 24 millimeter view to do this. Next. So here we can see the upper and lower lids at the same time. And the infrared LEDs are used to see the meibomian glands. Next. So you manually mark, you outline the area that you want to be uh, image processed digitally. Next. And with a click of a button, this is done, showing a 3D representation of the meibomian glands. Next. And the volume that can be analyzed and the tortuosity. There is a project running right now where the mybo scan is used to look at where the meibomian glands drop out first. It appears they probably drop out nasally first, but this is under study right now. You can see there's a big area of dropout in blue, and the remaining glands are tremendously uh, tortuous and dilated and inspissated. Next. So the external ocular photography code, CPT code 92072, 
uh, can be used for these studies with an average reimbursement nationwide of $40. Next. Inflamadry is coming soon. This is a rapid point of care test to detect the MMP9s in the tear film. And um, it's quick. It's 10 minutes. And it is CE Mark. It's being sold in Europe. It's not quite available in the U.S. yet. It's expected to be available within uh, the rest, within the next six months, probably. Well, pending 510K review by the FDA. It is very, very non-invasive. Um, you do have to touch the conch with it, as you'll see. Next. But it's, it's quite comfortable, and I've, I've done this on myself and on patients when we were part of the clinical trial. So matrix metalloproteinase 9, when the level is elevated in the tear film, it is a very good marker for inflammation. And uh, text can do this. It's very low cost. You don't have to buy any additional equipment. You use it once, throw it away. It's extremely sensitive and specific. Next. And it works very much like a pregnancy test. So. Um, I don't know what the cost will be in the U.S. because it hasn't hit the market yet. Next. But, okay, okay, um, yep, next one. So this is what it looks like. A negative test is on the right with one blue bar, and that means that there were enough tears sucked up into the cassette, but the test is negative. That means there is less than 40 nanograms per mil of MMP9. A positive test shows the blue bar and a red bar. Next. And this shows how you do it. You, you go gently dab the collector in six or eight locations along the lower lid on the palpebral conch without dragging sideways, just dabbing up and down. Then number two, you snap the sample collector into the cassette. Number three, bottom left, you dip this cassette into a buffer vial for 20 seconds. And uh, bottom right, you just wait 10 minutes. So you put this down in the exam lane. You walk outside and put a post-it note on the outside so you know to go see somebody else for 10 minutes and you come back and read it. Next. Next, Craig. Okay. So let me just review some of the revenue opportunities to having a dry eye center of excellence. This is... Uh, data uh, that I got from Bruce Muller, who is um, the consultant par excellence uh, to the biggest and best ophthalmic practices in the United States and to most of the major pharmaceutical companies and, and uh, device companies as well. So he was nice enough to share this with me, and then I'll show you how I expanded and added some things to his basic model. So first dry eye patients generate revenue because they come to the office. So they get an initial test to identify the problem and ongoing or follow-up treatment. But they also have a lot of other comorbidities. They have seasonal allergies and myopia and glaucoma and macular degeneration and 14% of cataracts. They also, when they're happy, refer other patients and have other eye conditions uh, that need to be managed. Next. So. This shows from Bruce what is the value of more of these patients in our practice. And he looked at one patient, and then we'll look at the addition of 1,500 dry eye patients to an average practice with modest, low-cost marketing. So these are using 2013 national Medicare rates. A new patient comprehensive exam brings in $140. A quick one-month follow-up to see how they're doing on their restasis, whatever, is 69 a three-month follow-up to see if they need plugs, whatever, is another $69. And the 12-month recall, a follow-up is 69 So the average annual revenue for the first year, at least, of a dry eye patient's life with you is $347. Many, 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 most of my patients end up with four plugs. This model wants to be conservative, so it said, OK, let's just assume they're getting Two plugs. If you put in two plugs, that's $211 extra. Next. Four plugs would be $370. So Bruce said that the average practice, if you have a small group, could easily get 1,500 more dry eye patients in. Uh, if you stuck a flyer in your invoices for a month or two, if you had your, we'll go over some of these tactics uh, in a few minutes, but it doesn't take much. A little bit of modest, cheap 
marketing and advertising to bring them in. So here we say 1,500 new patients have come in for their dry eyes. We know from uh, repeated Gallup polls exactly how many of these 1,500 people will have cataracts, how many will have glaucoma, how many will need plugs. And this assumes that you can only capture 50% of the cataracts to, and convince them to stay with you for their surgery. This assumes that your charming self can only capture half the glaucoma patients. So I think that's a low estimate. I think once they get in your practice, if, if unless you, you know, really have a have them wait a long time, or you're mean, or you have a really dirty office, unless something terrible happens, you're probably going to capture more than half. But this model, once again, wants to be conservative. So you look at the second row, the revenue rate per patient, and the gross revenue across the bottom. So a very modest estimate is $731,650 $731, during that first year with your 1,500 patients. Next. Now, I took the model. I added osmolarity myself to Bruce's model. 1,500 patients. Both eyes are tested four visits per year. Really, it's a rare patient that doesn't see me four times during the first year if they have uh, anything other than the mildest of dry eye. So you're doing 12,000 osmolarity tests. You get reimbursed $2,271 per eye, so that's $272,520. The tier osmolarity system costs nothing as long as you commit to a certain number of cards. So the cost of the cards is $10. So you subtract out 120,000. Your net revenue for tier lab osmolarity testing on top of the revenue I just showed you from the visits is another $152,000. Next. Now, I told you this already, so we'll keep clicking for the sake of time. Keep going. And I told you about how to bill for it. Okay, next. So now let's talk about Nutritional supplements. Many, many people are into this now, uh, ophthalmologists. Of 1,500 new dry eye patients, if you could only get 5% of them to buy supplements from you, which would mean that you have a truly pathetic ability to sell, but if you could only get 5% to buy yours, it would be an extra 7,500 a year. You know, you know, things are rough now, and uh, you know, lots and lots of people are turning to these, as well as cosmeceuticals. Next. And some of the best are available only through doctors. Now let's look at tier science. Now this came from them. This is not Bruce Miller or me. This came from the tier science people. And it's once again an incredibly uh, modest or timid uh, model so, so as not to set expectations too high. This is a practice that sees only 100 patients per week. And this is the number of weeks of practice the, the doctors are practicing. That's 50, assuming two weeks off for vacation. This is the number of patients with dry eye. We know it's 50% of everybody marching through the door. So next, this assumes that basically you're Marcus Welby, that this is a very, very um, small practice. Next, yeah, a doctor who sees very few patients per hour. So with this in mind, the, this is the annual estimated number of patient visits for the practice, 5,000. Whoop, whoop, whoop. OK. Did you do that? You did that. All of a sudden, all of a sudden it got bigger. Um, so if we, if we assume that in the first year, you know, we know how many patients are going to come in with, out of those with dry eye. If we assume, assume during the first year, that you're only able to convert 10%, go back to the last one, 10% to have uh, lipid view and lipid flow, which is, I think, very low. The next year, it's 18%. The third year, it's 22%. As you gain more confidence and patients tell their friends and they come in. Next, please. So this calculates that year one, you'll be making an extra, backing out um, paying the technician and the physician for their time, backing out the cost of the equipment, backing out the $15 uh, dollar per patient user fee, backing it all out, <clears throat> you make over $4,500 the first uh, year per week, over $12,000 per week 
the second year and over 13,000, almost 14,000 per week the third year. Next. <coughs> By the way, debriding of the lid margins, lots of people do this with a little hockey stick right before they do uh, lip of flow. Next. It's not painful if you use a little tetravisc. And uh, the code for this is 65205. And you have to check with your specific carrier, but the range is 60 to $80 per, uh, dollars per debriding. So if you did one debridement per day for 50 weeks, uh, assuming that you practice four days out of the week and you operate one day out of the week, that's 200 debridements per year. And at $70 per debridement, that's an extra $14,000. Next. A lot of these patients have an extremely thin fibrovascular membrane over their meibomian gland. So going over it with a hockey stick is, is a very useful thing to do. And it, it makes the uh, lipid flow more effective. So if you buy a Keratograph 5M, it's just a hair under $20,000. The lease is $613 per month for a 36-month financing program. So at $40 per photo, you need to take 15.3 external photos per month to break even which is not counting the income you could gain from using uh, it as a topography unit. And after your last payment, the customer owns the device. Next. So tips for inexpensive but very effective marketing. I'm a big fan of inserting a one-page flyer in a bright color, an obnoxious color, into each invoice for at least a quarter or longer, or maybe every single invoice you ever send out, or maybe you could pulse it like every other quarter you stick these in explaining that you're a dry eye center of excellence. Come in, bring somebody you know who has dry eyes. Extremely effective. We did this. I can't tell you uh, how great this very low-tech, inexpensive form of marketing was. Of course, flyers, brochures, wall posters in the office, in the lobby, in the dilating area. And I, I consider uh, the backside of the exam door to be prime real estates and also the other walls on the exam lane. Because after the people have checked their uh, their iPhone, their smartphone, for email and text, so they start reading everything. And this, this really is a great way to talk to them about your dry eye center of excellence. Dry eye seminars still work. Uh, recently, a friend of mine in Texas uh, with a, a good-sized practice, but it's a solo practice, he, he did some modest marketing of his dry eye seminar. 150 people showed up. Then he did one a month later, and another 150 showed up. So they still work. Also, you can use a media hook for your local television. That means you are the first one to offer fill in the blank. If you know for sure you're the first one to have one of these things, call your local TV stations. They, they may want to cover it. Or they love anniversaries, like you've just performed your 100th lip of, lip of flow or your whatever. Uh, they love a media hook like that. Another great way to get media attention is to perform the test or procedure on some famous TV personality. And once again, you know, have your staff wear buttons that say, do you have dry eye, talk to me, et cetera. Next. Oh, by the way, all these companies have fabulous marketing people. You do not have to reinvent the wheel. If you tell them you want a press release to send to your local newspaper, they've got it. If you want a TV ad, if you actually want to go to that length, a radio ad, they've got the scripting. All you have to do is tell them because they can't succeed unless you do. So. Uh, the smartest marketing people I ever ran into in my life worked for these companies. So anyway, the bottom line is that it really is good medicine to treat dry eye and blepharitis. And we have far better diagnostic technologies and treatments than we did five years ago, which leads to happier patients and better surgical outcomes. Also, it's good business to treat dry eye and blepharitis because of the direct profits and the halo effect of the referrals. There is almost no medical or legal exposure, medical legal exposure, for treating dry eyes and blepharitis. And when this recession is finally and completely over, these patients will remember your practice for their elective procedures. So there we have it. Thank you. Next one. Next slide is just my thank you slide. And we can um, open it to questions. <coughs> 